All right, welcome to the first of its kind, world-changing manufacturers network. Lisa Ryan has her ears to the ground and her heart in the game. Get ongoing education and new connections right here with Lisa and the manufacturers network. Buckle your seat, listen, and spread the word. Here's Lisa. Hey, it's Lisa Ryan. Welcome to the Manufacturers Network podcast. I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Jim Verwert. Jim is an enterprise solutions executive with Tooling U SME, which is a division of the Society of Manufacturers Engineers. Jim travels the country and collaborates with world class manufacturers to develop work course, performance, and training solutions. So Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. So share with us a little bit about your background and what led you ultimately to Tooling U SME. Sure. I began my career in manufacturing working for a very small industrial distributor out of Moline, Illinois. They're no longer in business. They've been acquired like so many industrial distributors have in the past, but the company was called DeLeon Thompson, and my territory was Central and Western Iowa, so the John Deere's and the Vermeer's and the Sour Dan Fosses, now Dan Fosses of the world <clears throat> in my territory, and we supplied metal cutting tools and metal working fluids to our customers. And it was interesting because this is coming up on 15 years ago. I would get the questions quite often. Hey, Jim, do you know any good lathe operators? Do you know any good mill operators? Do you know any good welders? And my answer was always the same back then. I do know some of those people, but they already have a job. So even back then, I saw a big need for a skilled workforce because help was hard to find. And along comes, at the time, Tooling University, as a workforce training and development tool. And the management of our company got us connected with Tooling University. And that was one of the, I call bullets in my holster, one of the lines we represented. And it really was a great marriage because of that tremendous need I kept seeing out in my territory. Fast forward to about six and a half years ago, Tooling U SME, they had since been acquired by SME, the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. About six and a half years ago, they gave me a phone call and here I am today and happy to do it because that need as prevalent as it was 10, 15 years ago out in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa, I see it everywhere I go coast to coast and border to border. Yeah, and that's, it's such a huge aspect right now because you look at not only have we had the pandemic for the last two and a half, 10 years is what it feels like. And we had lots of baby boomers retiring beforehand, but now they're even there's even more of a mass exodus as we are reassessing our priorities. And these people are thinking, do I really want to end my career or keep doing what I'm doing? Or do I want to go and play with my grandkids and enjoy the rest of my life? So I'm sure that you're seeing that from both a training standpoint and a, an employee attraction standpoint. But let's talk first about how are you seeing manufacturers retain that brilliance, the industry knowledge, the expertise, the skills that are walking out the door so that the next generation of workers can get a jump start? Great question. They are, they're doing everything they can to retain them. But like you said, to the worker that's been on the floor or in the office for 25, 30, 35 years, they're ready to go play with their grandson and go fishing off into the sunset of retirement. Some of those employers don't retain them completely, but they will have them come back on a part-time basis as consultants. So they will retire, yet have a gentleman's agreement, if you will, that, hey, if we really get in a, a pickle <laughs> on the floor and Bill was the only one that knew how to finish this part or to run this machine or to fix this machine when it went down, please be on call and you'll agree to come in and help us out. And it's such a, when we look at the 
flexibility that is an expectation of employees too. We look at flexibility from younger workers coming in, but that sounds like such a great way to take advantage of our more tenured employees, our skilled employees, still keeping them relevant, keeping them, giving them some money coming in, but then again, addressing their need for spending time outside of work. So do you have a, examples or big stories where you've seen that work? Yeah, I have one. I won't mention the name, but they're down the road from me here. They, I call it the Monday morning factor. They actually offered a bunch of early retirements because COVID really did put into warp speed a lot of these practices of early retirement. Let's cut the budget. Let's because, you know, nobody really knew what was happening and what the long-term effects were going to be. But they found out one of the immediate effects was they had let the wrong person go on Friday and literally on Monday morning, they were standing there trying to figure something out and they nobody knew how to do it because the person that knew how to do it was already retired. So that's that's just the reality that, that we went through. Now, one thing that, that we have started helping customers with is, first of all, raise that awareness and look at your pipeline of your employees and look at that retirement pipeline. Who's coming up in the next six months, year, two years? What is their skill set? What do they do? Are they, is that a department of 10 people that all do the same one person that has that specific tribal knowledge that's uh, getting ready to retire? But I've literally gotten those phone calls three or four years later. Hey, Jim, we got so-and-so retiring at the end of October. Can you folks get in here? and help us out and capture as much as you can from this person before they walk out the door. And it makes them feel relevant as far as the knowledge that they're bringing, but then they're, you're really cutting down the learning curve from the people that are coming up who don't necessarily know the history of why that job is being done that way and they're getting to hear it from an expert. Absolutely. That's And you just hit on a very critical point the whys behind something. We do so many things in our daily lives that become second nature to us, but not knowing the whys behind things. Why are we approaching this part at this certain entry angle? Why are we changing the tool at this point and not going another 10 parts? All these things. And that's that's something that can get lost in a black and white world, if you will. There's SAT and AI and robots and all these things are fantastic. But there's still that human element that's, there's some parts of it that are just irreplaceable until you actually do that mentoring or that one-on-one -on -one OJT or that training of the whys and the tribal knowledge to fully comprehend and understand and be able to produce a good part and continue good quality. Well, and mentoring is another big area to do that, where you're actually putting together your tenured employees and maybe your new kids on the block coming in and have them build those relationships and actually learn from each other. Could There could also be some reverse mentoring going on with the younger folks being able to share their thoughts about technology and apps and the things that they're seeing so again, let's take a look at, talk about mentoring for a couple minutes. What are some of the best practices that you are seeing manufacturers do? Yeah, that's a great question. And you hit on a great point too, that multi-generational mentoring. There's sometimes the, uh, the more seasoned workforce, if you will, that is not as familiar with technology as the younger workforce is. And if they were be able to learn just a couple of little tricks or be able to implement just a few things and apply it to their job, it would make their job so much easier, faster and quicker. But they've never had anybody that they've really been able to talk to and develop a relationship. And the same goes the other way where the whys, why do I have to manually do this when I can just punch a couple of numbers on my phone or punch a couple of numbers here? There's just, there's certain things that have to be done a certain way. And being able to explain that and develop those mentoring relationships. And not only that, then it's just, you know, it's a passing of the guard, if you will. It's a cultural and a more of on a personal level to develop that sense of pride and that sense of workmanship and craftsmanship that so many of our seasoned workforce has developed. I, it's, I call it the good old American no. Try to try to define that in one sentence. There's 
examples all across the country. I'll never forget one time in my former job, there was a foundry that I called on and they made castings for the aerospace industry and for the U.S. military. And the guy kept telling me, these are handcrafted castings. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean they're handcrafted? He said, they pour the castings and they do, and they cut off the risers and the gate. They do all this stuff, but then they take it to their shop and by hand, they sand it here and they sand it there and they do this and they do that. And then different kinds of wood in different places in the castings and just all these different processes that literally took years, if not decades to perfect. And that has to be a mentoring environment to be able to pass that kind of craftsmanship on to the next generation. Well, and it works when that person is sharing the passion for it. Just in you relating that story, you could hear that that passion coming through. It's castings for goodness sake, but there was so much pride in exactly what went into that process that when somebody is mentoring a newer worker coming in and conveying some of that, listen, I've done this, you can do it too. And it's not going to happen overnight. We're going to work together and I'm going to try to shortcut the circus, the, shortcut the process, but still letting you experience some of that success. I think that too many times in manufacturing, we don't give people a, enough, enough credit for the pride that they have in what they do because they're pieces, parts, they're components. We think they're doing the same thing every day. But when you find the right people and they love what they do, it's magic. It really is. And it becomes a family. I'll never forget a shop on the west side of Des Moines that I used to go to. This was a group of guys and gals that their number one goal was to be able to do things that all the other shops in the area could not. That was the work they wanted so that they could carry that banner higher than anybody else and pat themselves on the back and fist pump and high five each other at the end of the day. And it was a magical place to be in sometimes because when they got the secret sauce and cracked the code, <laughs> I tell you what, it was, it was quite the special moment. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. And you can feel culture. You can walk into any plant and you can, just by walking in there, you can feel the energy. Do people like working here? Do they not like working in there? Not only from a customer standpoint, but if you're interviewing applicants and you have a culture that doesn't feel good, there's no way they're accepting your job offer. Exactly. Exactly. And people pick up on that. People pick up on that. So we've talked a lot about the, the more tenured workforce and the fact that we're losing them, but we also have to look at the opposite end of the scale of attracting more people into manufacturing, of changing the conversation so that parents and guidance counselors and the public as general realize what a great career path it is. So when it comes to the training solutions that you're seeing that world-class manufacturers are doing, what are some of the things that they're implementing? Yeah, great question and great point. It, and you mentioned uh, parents, I think it was, or the school. Yep, parents and yeah. guidance counselors. Yeah, guidance counselors. That, that, that's exactly where it is. Another very large aviation company, the vice president said a while back, he said, if we don't get them at the junior high level or before, we've already lost them. And that's just critical. And it's literally re retraining our culture here in the United States. And with all due respect to college graduates, that's great. We need them. But I think uh, everybody could agree that not every single person that's drawn a breath of air is queued up and ready and a good fit to go to a four-year college. And just being able to give them options and letting them see different career pathways at an early age is critical. I'm, I sit on a board at a local high school here that has a great shop. They have about eight welding booths. They have a lathe, a mill, a plasma cutting table. And when I go to those meetings a couple of times a year to listen to those instructors talk about their students and the things that excite those students where they got their first small 3D printer 
and they let them pick whatever they wanted to print, like a small airplane or a small guitar pick or whatever their passion was, go ahead and do that. And boy, those kids were walking up and down the hallways of the school, showing them off to all their friends. Say, hey, look what I made. I had, of course, had to program it, had to get the the machine set and do all these things. And and it really energized them. I think it's that energy, that spirit, what we were talking about before, but at the capturing that and generating that in the younger generation. Because again, and excuse me if I'm going on and on, but I remember going to Southern Wisconsin for training in my former job and hearing about all the shop classes and all the high schools and the community colleges that were closing left and right. And that's Mm -hmm. such a heavy German industrial part of the country. A lot of the German tool companies are headquartered there in the Milwaukee area. And to hear that, it's just really a culture blow to our country. So I think the good news is you're doing things like this. Those conversations are happening. There's people like Mike Rowe (laughs) talking out there on a higher, even bigger stage, maybe just raising this awareness and engaging anybody and everybody that'll listen. We need manufacturing for the security, for the safety, for the services that our people are accustomed. Yeah, when I was in high school, I know I took both wood shop and metal shop primarily because I didn't want to take home ec, but <laughs> but it was just fun and you're right. And then for years, all of those programs disappeared and it is so nice to see them coming back now. Our community college here in Cleveland, Cuyahoga Community College has a whole manufacturing technology center. We're starting to see the schools that are opening up. But you made a really important point that if you don't get them by junior high, you've lost them because that's the generation that's coming into the workforce now is that by the time they graduate high school, they already have an idea of what they're going to do. So using things like manufacturing day, the first Friday in October and trying to get into the schools, talking to people, talking to parents, doing plant tours, I was just at a facility a couple weeks ago, and when I was pulling into the parking lot, they had all of their signs, join our team, great hours, great work culture. And the thing that the, of all the signs, the one that gets the most um, action from is work with your hands. They have a billboard that says, if you want to work with your hands, because there's something that immediate gratification of being able to create something, of being able to see this is what I made. And you're right. Why go to a four-year college if you're not cut out for it and come out with all that student loan debt and then go flip burgers? Can I share a couple of stories from the road? Absolutely. To to highlight this. And again, it's to, to no fault of their own. I always joke about myself when I started in this industry, I didn't know the difference between an end mill and a windmill. Because you don't know what you don't know. It's not your fault. But I'll never forget, I was driving through South Carolina about four years ago and listening to one of the local radio stations. And the University of South Carolina had done a study of high school students in, in the state. And they came to the conclusion it was somewhere around 80% of high school students did not know how to change a light bulb. Why? Wow. Because they'd never had to do it before. I'm sure their parents love them dearly. I'm sure they would do anything for them. But I think sometimes maybe parents might do a little too much for children at times. You know, go ahead. How do you think we should change that light bulb? What do you think? Maybe turn it off and let it cool down for a little bit. So when you touch it, it's not hot. Going back to some of that tribal knowledge, to some of that mentoring. You know, why this is why you have to do this. So there's one story. The other story is, and I got this in a lot of places. One of the first things they would do when they were looking to hire an applicant is they would give them a tape measure and ask them, show me five and three quarters. Well, they they didn't, they had no idea what they were saying because they'd never held a tape measure in their entire life. Wow. And the last one was the screwdrivers. They had some new maintenance younger people and they were talking amongst themselves and they said oh that's not the minus that's the plus screwdriver wow description for flathead and phillips wow 
So I think that just that kind of highlights, like we were talking about earlier, the need and the opportunity that we have ahead of us. I guess the good news is we can, the only place we can go is up now. Yeah. Well, and I, it's just so funny you say that because my dad growing up, he had his wood shop in the basement and I can't tell you how many hours down there I'd be down there watching him look at the tool, work with the tools and stuff like that. And just things that you take for granted. I had one of the guests on my show a while ago, Miranda Martz, who I actually met at, at Tooling You. She would, her dad fixed cars and she would go and she would just watch her dad and fix cars along with him. And just that little thing is what decided her whole career path. So that's the thing. Maybe parents aren't necessarily changing their own oil and stuff, but getting your kids involved in your hobbies, what you're passionate about, looking for ways to, to introduce them, changing a tire. Now, mind you, I know how to change a tire. I just have AAA, so I choose not to. <laughs> <laughs> I think about light bulbs. It's like these things blow out, what, once every 10 years? So none of us are really changing light bulbs that often. But it's the point of just knowing the basic necessities and exposing kids at as young of an age as possible, because there's going to be a small percentage of them that are going to say, that's what I want to do. How do I feel that? And I will say the good news is the, I think, what is it? The Gen Z, this latest generation yep. up and coming, yep. they're really taking the bull by the horns. There's some really good interest being generated. So maybe we're already generating some interest and lighten that spark. I thank the good Lord that's happening because manufacturing is so important and so critical to our country because especially in this day and age, you don't want to depend on other countries. I won't name any names for things that are just important. Medicine, food, shelter, energy. There's so much that goes into us just being able to live a good life that comes from the manufacturing industry. I'll never forget one of the best t-shirts I saw was, and on the eighth day, God created tool and die makers. There you go. You just let that set and sizzle for a while. And if somebody doesn't know what a tool and die maker is, I'd be happy. Not that I am one. I'm not claiming to be, but I'd be happy to let them know what they do and how important they are. Yeah. And we've talked about both spectrums, the older retired workers and the younger ones coming in. But we have this whole group of people who are already working with us and we want to be able to retain them. So making sure that we're training those people, that we're giving them the opportunities to skill their, their level of expertise. So when it comes to employee retention, what are you seeing as far as upskilling the people who are already working for you, giving them opportunities so that you can keep them? Great question. What we see with the demographics the way they are and talking about a lot of these people retiring, a lot of the people that are also retiring is the leadership of mm. these big manufacturing companies. This person may have been on the machine or on the line for five and 10 years and they're doing a great job. But they might be at the point of where is this what the rest of my life is going to be? And if they're a good candidate, I see a lot of frontline leadership starting to take place, that kind of training, because that's just keep that career advancement and those career pathways to retention. I think that's a big part. And I think that whoever it was that said, come work with your hands, they really hit the nail on the head because everybody, I don't care what generation, everybody wants to feel like they are contributing. They want to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And if you can develop a career pathway, whether they're young in the middle of their career or getting to the end of their career, if you can develop that sense of contribution, what you're doing is very important, not only for your own self and your own family, if you have a family, but for the good of our company, the good of our country, et cetera, that I think is the secret sauce to retention. Absolutely. All righty. As we start to get to the end of our time together, if somebody did want to continue the conversation or learn what a tool and die maker is, <laughs> what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, probably the best way would be to send me an email, jim.verwert 
And I'll spell that V like Virginia, E like Edward, R like Ralph, W O E R T at toolingu.com. And if that's right. too much, just go to toolingu.com and, and they can hook you up. Wonderful. Jim, thank you so much for joining with me, joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. Great talking with you. I'm Lisa Ryan, and this is the Manufacturers Network Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Manufacturers Network Podcast. Do me a favor and share this podcast with your friends and colleagues so we can grow this network and connect more fantastic folks just like you. You can either send your buddies to the website at manufacturers-network.com or share the Manufacturers Network podcast on your LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you and your industry friends hang out. The bigger and faster we grow the network, the stronger and deeper the community will all have. Thanks again, and I appreciate you.